I had two hours to agree and two weeks to prepare. We were going to New Jersey. I had just finished my qualifying exam and hadn't had time to catch up with the news. I knew New Jersey was having issues with their water filters in Newark, but I thought it would kind of blow over. This was a crisis that was brewing and it was catching national attention. Nervous doesn't even begin to describe how I felt. The day had come, I woke up early. I had 20 minutes to present to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner and her staff. We get to the building and we had to check in with our licenses at the security desk with all of the guards that probably had more than just flashlights. And it was time. They, someone came and got us and we walked down the hallway with past these windows with government seals, and I get to the conference room, I set up, I'm anxious, and I begin. But within the first three slides, I was interrupted with questions. But these weren't just any questions. These weren't like the questions you get at a conference or a webinar where the attendees are just curious. They had a problem, a big one, and they needed answers. They had millions of dollars on the line. 40,000 filters, over 300,000 people that they were worried about. They weren't just interested in my answers, they needed them. And over the past two years, I have been becoming one of the leading experts on lead certified pitcher and faucet filters, investigating under which conditions these filters work and don't work. And in the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's case, they were interested in when the filters did not work. They were nervous. They had come to me with questions and concerns in their eyes, looking for perspective and some context of their problem. And they were looking directly at me. If you told me 10 years ago that I would be in that room as the one with answers, I would say I'd laugh, but I wouldn't even be able to comprehend what you were saying. I grew up in Southeast Atlanta in Ellenwood, Georgia, and I went to Cedar Grove High School where it was, when I first started, it wasn't known for its academics. It was more so known for drugs and fighting and good trap music. But I think the pitfall at my school was that they didn't expect much from us, or most of us. I had some counselors tell me that my aspirations were too high when I decided I wanted to be valedictorian. And another counselor told me that they wouldn't allow me to take multiple AP classes because I'd make their failure rate go up. But I brushed these comments off because I had counter arguments, I had teachers um, who encouraged me, a village of science teachers who told me that I was different. I was not a statistic, I was an exception. And they treated me as such, which resulted in exposure and opportunities. They raised the expectations for me to not compete against my classmates, but against myself. So I did it, I did all of it. Step team and varsity cheerleading co-captains. I was an FBLA, I was yearbook editor, senior and junior class president, Miss Cedar Grove, which is higher than homecoming queen, and the class of 2012's valedictorian. Be the change you wish to see in the world. If you can change it, change it. And if you can't, change you. Instead of identifying problems, find a solution. Instead of looking for jobs, create them. Be entrepreneurs, innovators, inventors, teachers, engineers. The world is at your disposal, and it's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. Thank you. As for what I wanted to do when I left, I had my heart set on being a high school science teacher mainly because the science teachers that I had, I saw the impact they had on me and my peers. They were more than just instructors. They were mentors and 
pseudo counselors. They broke up fights and they were parents for us when ours weren't there. So when they asked me what I wanted to be, essentially I said, you. <laughs> They're like, that's poetic and all, but um, how about you go be an engineer? <laughs> um, I told them I didn't know what an engineer was and they encouraged me and said that you should challenge yourself and that you can have an impact on the world and change it for the better. But um, I wasn't really buying it. I didn't know what engineers did. Um, and so they rephrased it like this. Engineers solve problems and they help people. And Jeannie, you love people. You also love the environment and you love math. So how about you go be an environmental engineer? And um, if you don't like that, get a PhD. That way you don't have to get a separate education degree. And I was sold. It's like, bet. Um, my 17 naive self decided I was going to go to get a PhD in engineering. I went to Clemson University to be an environmental engineer. And when I got there, it was a culture shock that took some adjusting. Home was an all black community and Clemson was very white and Clemson engineering was very male. Um, I didn't quite feel like I belonged for obvious reasons, but it was more than that. I didn't think like them. I could do the work, but I couldn't quite connect with their version of the help people part of engineering. And our curriculum was always a few degrees separated from the people we were solving problems for. Jeannie Marie Osorio, Calhoun Honors College. I decided to go to grad school for a PhD at Virginia Tech. I was hoping to find that connection I was longing for, but I found way more than I was bargaining for. In the fall of 2016, I attended a TED Talk given by Sid Roy on public inspired science. In other words, anyone can be a hero. Think about that idea for a second. Why don't we teach science and engineering like that? Where heroism and public service are seen as key values. The talk spoke about this bottom-up approach of science that worked with citizens and was successful in uncovering the crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the work done by Dr. Mark Edwards. It's like a, a big research experiment here to figure out what went wrong. When I left Sid's talk, I realized that that connection was what I was looking for. I set up a meeting with Dr. Mark Edwards and he invited me to Flint, Michigan for an alternative spring break to do outreach in the schools. And I was elated. We visited several schools um, and after school programs with kids varying from kindergarten to 12th grade. We were there to talk to them about the science behind what happened to their water system, devoid of the politics on the news. We showed them the scientific method and did hands-on activities um, where they were able to learn about pH of different chemicals and household products and how pH can determine whether or not the pipes corrode. My favorite memory was of this cute little black girl um, with pigtails. She was really engaged and she asked a lot of questions um, when I was about to leave, she hugged me and told me that I was so smart and so pretty and she wanted to be just like me. Those were her words, not mine, because I'm humble. Um, I count it as a privilege to go to those schools because they're filled with little brown babies and they may never have another opportunity to meet an engineer, especially one that is black and a woman. And so it was important for them to see me, to see me with my face beat, my eyebrows neat, and my hair laid. So I encouraged her. I told her that she could be an engineer just like me and to not allow for anyone to tell her that she can't do anything she sets her mind to. Then we went to a school that was a lot like Cedar Grove. 
the kids were rowdy and distracting. And right before I was getting ready to set up, the teacher told me almost as a word of caution that the lead really messed these kids up and it's they are the worst that he's ever seen. Um, in my head, I was like, hmm. Nah, they're just bad. Um, we were bad and didn't even have a lead problem. And today with us being here is like having a substitute teacher, which is a free pass to act out. Needless to say, I was able to take control of the room and calm down the chaotic ringleaders because I remember having classes like that and I knew what my teachers had to do in order to get us together. <laughs> but. Later, when we told another kid that he could be an engineer just like us, he disagreed. He said, I can't do that because I'm lead poisoned and I can't learn. Like, who told you that? Before this crisis happened, these kids were already faced with poverty and poor school systems and had a big enough fight in front of them to not be a statistic. It is one thing to be told this and another to believe it. Those words out of a child's mouth are more lethal than the lead that has entered and left their bloodstreams. Think about it. What would you do if you believed you couldn't learn anything? What happens to a school filled with kids that believe they can't learn? Where did they get this from? This belief has been validated by their parents, their teachers, and the world. We, we told them that with every news cycle, share on Facebook, and retweet. How do you counter that? Who's going to tell them that they can overcome this? We can fix their water system, but they can't get these years back. The greatest casualty that we will never account for is those kids' futures. I left Flint overwhelmed. This this is big, bigger than anything that I could do. How do you even begin to fix this? Because it, it can't stay like this. Where do you, where do we go from here? There was a class called Engineering Ethics in the Public taught by Dr. Edwards. And it spoke a lot about the Flint and DC water crises. And I took it in hopes of finding some type of answer to this question. This class's case study was focused on Denmark, South Carolina, and an elderly couple in their 70s, Miss Pauline Ray Brown, Miss Paula, and Eugene Smith. Their story was crazy, barely believable. Ms. Paula and Eugene have been fighting their bad and expensive water in Denmark for the past 10 years. They have collected over 40 jars of water samples with dates and times since 2009. They collected newspaper clippings, high priced water bills, health records, letters to state reps, everything they could find really, all in one overstuffed three inch binder. They drive 20 miles round trip to Healing Spring in order to get water to wash their hair, brush their teeth, cook and rinse dishes. See how I, this one we had to come? We've been coming here since 2009. 2009. Water, 2009. That's a long time. Dr. Edwards scheduled a trip to Denmark and asked students if they wanted to go. I said yes because I wanted to see the story for myself. Our trip was focused on sampling a few homes and getting data. When it was time to leave Denmark, I took boxes 
to the car filled with samples. And then Eugene handed me the binder to make sure I put it in the car for Mark. Then when we got back to Blacksburg, Mark asked if I wanted to, mainly because I had the binder. He asked if I wanted to go through the documents for my class project, and I said yes. I took on the challenge of going through these records that they've collected over the years in order to see how they fit chronologically. I found some additional documents and I summarized it and put it all in a binder as a gift back to Paula and Eugene, um, who had become like family, my mom and pop in Denmark. And uh, I tell all of my children who are all in Florida, I say, the young lady we met, I say, she's beautiful, she's smart. And I said, I wish I would have been smart like that. Mommy, well, you can't, everybody can't be the same. I said, well, she's a beautiful, and she's a beautiful person. And she, she, she know, she know all the big words that I can't even pronounce. I said, we really, me and Jean really care for her. We love her. And we were so happy we got her in our life. That's number mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. But she's a sweet person. And we're going to keep, if, if, if this, if something uh, this thing get ready to be over with, over with after so many years. We gonna still keep in touch. What? Mm -hmm. And we love you. <laughs> it was real to me. I put my feet in their shoes. I took the journey to Healing Spring, the place where they get refreshed to fight another day. Their stories barely caught the news. I didn't know if they'd ever get the money or the attention needed in order to fix their system. I wasn't even sure if anybody other than them would use or read the research that I did, but it was the least I could do to help. There was a crisis brewing here too, only this one was quiet and 10 years in the making before we ever got involved. Through our continued research, water testing, and working with Denmark community activists, we found out the town was actually adding a pesticide to their water. It is called halisan and it's commonly used to disinfect pools and spas. The pesticide is also known to cause significant eye and skin irritation, and it's not approved for use in drinking water. And on top of that, Denmark has been adding halicin to the drinking water for the past 10 years. This was a silver bullet that helped back the residents' decade of unanswered complaints about their water. It was vindication for Paul and Eugene, and eventually it led to actual acknowledgement from the media and the local and state governments. There was no way I could possibly imagine that happening at the time when I finished writing this report. During the time I was delving through the water history of Denmark, Mark got awarded the HUD grant um, to study pitcher and faucet filters to see how they perform under extreme corrosion conditions, pushing them past their breaking point to determine when they worked and when they didn't. He asked if I wanted um, to take it on and I said yes. This is when things became more than just science to me. When I took on the project, I crossed the threshold where the people came first. When I said yes, I didn't think about how much work this would be or how many people I would need to pull this off or how boring it can be to watch water filter. I saw it as a potential solution for Paul and Eugene and other residents to protect themselves. These filters served as a line of defense for them. In the case, if their government doesn't acknowledge what is going on or it could take too long to fix. I didn't dream of being a filter expert. I got here through a series of blind yeses. Yes to a PhD in engineering, Yes to going to Flint, yes to going to Denmark, yes to going through that binder, and yes to the filter project. Fast forward two years, 12 undergraduate students, 11 water conditions, and 10 filter brands, and a couple thousand gallons of water later, 
I'm here in Newark, New Jersey as the one with answers to weighty questions. In the face of impossibly huge problems, I get to be an engineer. And the beauty of engineering is that I not only get to identify problems and criticize them, which is where society likes to stay, I can find a solution. And when that solution doesn't fix it all, I get to find another one. But don't get it twisted. Engineering is hard. It's funny to me how they try to convince you to go into engineering because you like math. Yeah, you like it in high school, but um, about first or second year of college, when you take Calc 2 with the multivariables, that class will hit you with a jab and a punch, and um, you'll be left wondering if you can still add and subtract. Grad school is also hard. Um, it feels like you're here forever. And sometimes I just want to run away because when things go wrong, you have to start over and progress is slow and you feel like you are never going to graduate and things are taking forever. And working with communities is not easy either. Um, it feels fruitless sometimes, especially when the world seems like the problems are just getting bigger and everything is just getting worse. And it amazes me that anytime I feel like this, it's almost like clockwork, Eugene calls me, almost as if he can sense me wanting to quit. My adopted daughter. <laughs> A few days ago, Eugene called me um, when I wasn't having one of my moments and he told me he had good news. A senator called him and told him that the state of South Carolina awarded Denmark with $1.65 million specifically to fix their pipes. This is amazing because they've had presidential candidates in their home. They have been featured on a CNN documentary, but this was the first tangible step to fixing their water problems. Everything else just yielded cases of bottled water. But this, this was a public acknowledgement from the state. You don't give over a million dollars to fix a system that you don't think is broken. It's not, it's not enough money in order to fix the whole thing, but it's a start. And today I'm here to tell you, it was science that set this city free. Ms. Paula and Eugene went back and forth um, talking about the exhaustion of their past, the people, all the people they know who gotten sick and all the years no one would listen, and the exhaustion of their future, knowing that this is a start, but there's a very long way to go. Um, I wonder how they held on for so long, like for 10 years. Well, I'm just gonna keep fighting till I, just everybody listen to me. I couldn't save all of the people. I saved some of them. I couldn't save everybody. But God has been good to me. Thank it took you. two years later after I wrote that report before they got this money. Nothing in comparison to the 10 years um, they have been waiting for, but um, I'm a part of the microwave generation. And to me, that's a long time. I haven't began to develop that type of patience I often ask Paul and Eugene, like, what made them stay and fight for 10 years? They could have given up or moved away, but Miss Paula always talks about how she was worried about the children and that they had been cooking with the bad water at the schools. And if she were to leave, who would be there to call the radio station for nine years? Um, and warn the parents about the water. She often cries about the children she couldn't save because they didn't believe her. She couldn't save that generation, but because of what they did and the Moms of Flint did and the communities that are still fighting, one day we won't have any more lead service lines even if we don't live to see it. And one day, there will be a generation of kids in Denmark and Flint and around the country that will not know what it's like to be afraid that there is lead in their drinking water. Where do I go from here? Um, 
I'd say I don't know because I didn't expect to be here in the first place. So I'll say wherever my next yes takes me. How do you save the world one yes at a time? point you said sometimes I want to run away where would you go um yeah I think about that I'd say every grad student has an escape plan what I really should have did is like back when YouTube was not like blown up right now in like 2012 when I started college I could have been an influencer all everyone said I could I should totally have done it um by now if I would have done it I'd have like a million followers you never would have met I never would have let Paul and Jean wouldn't wouldn't have helped all the people. So I have to tell myself that too. But then I just think about my life. Like I could totally have been an influencer. I think people would watch me, you know, maybe. But it's oversaturated now. I miss my window. But you know, I could. I could totally do it. And then ten years from now, you would actually be like, I remember her. She was, and then they made her mad, or like they, she, she ran away.